Hey there, my fellow Restore leaders. Troy McMahon here, and I just want to say welcome to our February micro-leadership community. See, here I am. I'm wearing my beloved Patrick Mahomes jersey, right? And the, and the truth is, I kind of feel a little giddy, right? Because I get the chance to wear this jersey in February again. Now, if you're watching this, you're either one of three different places. You're either waiting for the Chiefs to win the Super Bowl, or right now you're celebrating the Chiefs as Super Bowl champions, or you're asking the question, how? How did we lose to the 49ers? Now, whichever way it goes, well, it has been a great, great football season. But I was reflecting on the Chiefs' victory recently against the Baltimore Ravens in the AFC Championship. And as I was thinking about it, I realized that I was witness to something significant. I was watching Patrick Mahomes go from being the best player on the field to being the best leader in the NFL. And the way it became apparent to me is I watched the second half of that game. We're up by 10 points, and Patrick Mahomes again and again and again did everything that he needed to do to help his team win. And nothing to increase his own statistics or numbers or pad his stats by making some sort of risky play that would reflect positive on him. And he wasn't selfish at all just so he could support his team with a win. Well, that made me do a little research about our future Hall of Fame quarterback. You know, when he was drafted in 2017, he wasn't even considered the best quarterback in the draft. No, no, several experts, they had him listed as two, three, and even the, the fourth best quarterback coming out of college that year. <laughs> I found this particular article about the Mahomes draft class. It says, uh, Trubisky, speaking of Mitch Trubisky, who was the number one quarterback taken, he leads a quarterback class that overall lacks talent. <laughs> well, that class included Patrick Mahomes. Well, in the draft, Patrick wasn't the first pick, all right? He wasn't even the first quarterback chosen. But, but somebody on the Chiefs personnel staff, well, they saw in Patrick this incredible potential. He was only 21 years old, hadn't even finished his senior year in college, but they said, this guy is going to be great. They saw so much potential that the Chiefs, they gave up three draft picks to move from picking 27th in the first round to the 10th pick. And it's there that they chose their future quarterback. And well, <laughs> we've been to six straight AFC championships and we played in four of the past five Super Bowls. Now that's not too bad. Well, it gets me thinking about some other draft picks. And these draft picks were definitely not on anybody's draft board as first round selections. The first one chosen, uh, it kind of went off like this. As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. And at once they left their nets and they followed him. So Jesus' number one draft pick in the 80-30 draft was Simon. Well, you and I know him better as Peter. And Jesus, he had 11 additional draft picks over the next few days, weeks, or months. We're, we're just not exactly sure how long the selection process took. And, and I love one particular story of his selection process. It went like this. Now, the next day, Jesus decided to leave Galilee. Finding Philip, he said to him, follow me. And Philip, like Andrew and Peter, they were from the town of Bethsaida. And Philip found Nathanael and told him, We have found the one Moses wrote about in the law, about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nazareth? Can anything good come from there, Nathanael asked? Come and see, said Philip. And when Jesus saw Nathanael approaching, he said to him, Here truly is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. How do you know me, Nathanael asked Jesus. 
Jesus answered, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree before Philip called you. And then Nathanael declared, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. And Jesus said, you believe because I told you I saw you under a fig tree? I mean, you will see greater things than that. And he then added, very, very truly, I tell you, you will see heaven open and angels of God ascending and descending onto the Son of Man. I, I love how Nathaniel, well, he's also known as Bartholomew in our Bible, wondering if there's any good that could come out of Nazareth. That's Jesus' hometown. And then Jesus, well, he does a little storytelling on Nathaniel under this fig tree, and Nathaniel just gushes. <laughs> I imagine Jesus chuckling and kind of responding to Nathaniel and going like, hey, if you're impressed with that, I'm going to blow your mind. By, by the way, here's the list of the 12 apostles that Jesus drafted, in case you didn't know. He appointed 12 that they might be with him and that he might send them out to preach and to have authority to drive out demons. These are the 12 he appointed. Simon, to whom he gave the name Peter, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. To them he gave the name Boerginus, which means sons of thunder. Andrew, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. You know, this entire ministry year, we're focused on spirit-led reproducing. Reproducing disciples, reproducing leaders, and reproducing missionaries. Now, just like Patrick Mahomes, he wasn't ready to be the leader that he is today. Not one of those 12 apostles were ready to write the story and change the world that they have in fact done. But Jesus saw their potential, the potential of who they would become, of what they would accomplish I love that Jesus had multiple I see in you conversations with his 12. I mean, Jesus told Nathaniel, I see in you an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. I mean, Jesus told Peter, I see in you someone who will fish for people. He also told Peter, I see in you a rock, a rock who will be foundational in getting this thing started called the church. Now, when we talk about ICNU conversations, we, we typically focus on positive affirmation or strengths or potential that we see. And I'll tell you, that's really good. That's very important. But Jesus, well, he had some ICNU conversations more focused on, on revealing opportunity for growth. With James and his brother John, Jesus said, I see in you sons of thunder. You guys are some guys who can be loud, but loud for the wrong reason. Jesus said to Peter as well, Peter, I see in you Satan, <laughs> and get behind me. Now, I don't particularly recommend you calling someone Satan, well, unless you're Jesus. But sometimes, sometimes I need a little jolt to help me see that I'm more focused on the things of this world than on the things of God. So there's a question I want to ask you. And I want to ask myself as well, who is there? Who do you have in your sphere of influence and relationships that God is prompting you, prompting you to observe, to see, and then to speak and to encourage their potential with an I see in you conversation? Now, when you speak to them, they, they may or may not become your next apprentice. That they may or may not become a leader. But let me just tell you, your affirming words can be life-giving. Your affirmation and calling out what you see can be catalytic to their spiritual growth, but I also think yours as well. So do me a favor right now. Just pause for a second and bring someone to mind. Maybe there's someone you've been thinking about that God has placed in front of you that you can tell them, I see in you. Or maybe this prompting right now is an opportunity for you to kind of commit to saying, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put on a new set of eyes. I'm going to put on a new set of glasses so that when I'm out and about, be it in my workplace or in my serving and leadership here at church or in my home, that I'm going to have a new set of glasses to see the potential in people 
and call it out. Now, one more challenge that I have for you. Here is the truth. I'm not done growing and developing. You are not done growing and developing. None of us are done growing and developing as leaders. And the truth is we all have blind spots. I mean, Peter did. Peter had a blind spot even after he was the leader in launching the church on the day of Pentecost. Sometime later, the Apostle Paul, he had to come and have this difficult, I see you conversation with Peter and kind of say, Peter, the way that you're treating the Gentiles when other Jewish believers are around, it's just not right. And Peter said, I didn't see it, but you're right. And it helped Peter see a blind spot. And it helped him grow and develop into even more effective leader of the first church. So I want to ask, who do you have in your life? Who is in your life that you trust? And I think it's important that you trust somebody, that they're going to tell you a truth on your behalf because they love you, not because they want to hurt you, even if it may sting a little bit, because none of us like to get kind of negative coaching or feedback, but we need to trust them enough so we can ask them, what do you see in me? What do you see in me that might be holding me back? Let me encourage you. Pray about it. Pray about who you might ask that question to. And then take the risk to ask them. I mean, be open to some feedback that can help you grow. I tell you, I've been blessed. I've been blessed to have some really key people in my life that love me enough to tell me some hard truths. And they've told me those hard truths most of the time when I've asked. When I've asked them, help me see the blind spots in my life that I can't see, that I can grow through and beyond. I tell you, my friends, I am so very grateful that we serve a God, a God who loves us unconditionally, that there is nothing I can do as a leader, as a pastor, as a husband, a friend, nothing I can do in any role in my life that would make God love me anymore. And there is nothing that I could do, no sin I could do, no way that I could behave that God would love me any less. But I am so very grateful that we have a God that loves us so much that he sees me where I am and wants to call me to something more. And God has this plan to use us, each of us in this community, to help ourselves and others grow. Let's pray. Father God, we are so grateful. Grateful that you love us, love us where we are, but love us enough to not let us stay there. Thank you for this group of people around us, this community, this community on mission, this community that loves and cares for one another, but God will call us to take next steps. Help us to have these bold, I see new conversations that affirm and encourage and lift up. God, help us to ask for feedback so that we ask how others see us, that maybe we could get clarity of our blind spots to continue to grow and to mature and become the people that you see us to be. Thank you, Father, for the work that we have yet to accomplish, but thank you so much for the work that you have done for us through Jesus in his death, his burial, and his resurrection. We come before you with gratitude, with thankfulness, and full of your love. We pray this in Jesus' name.